Hello, Jim Coyle here, speaking to you from Sydney Conservatorium of Music on Gadigal Country here in Sydney, uh, speaking to you on behalf of Australian Autumn Music. When we consider composing music for children to perform, we need to think of it as composers first and foremost, not as composers for children. In other words, I think the, the approach is best summed up by, um, by a quote from one of my musical heroes, Benjamin Britten, the English composer of the 20th century, who, when he was speaking about composing music for children, he said, into these misshapen bottles I try to pour my very best wine. And that is so important that we don't write down for children, we don't give them se our second best music, only the best will do. Children are discerning, children have taste, children are perceptive, they realise when they are performing music of a very high quality, they realise when the composer was sincere, was making important points, was giving of their best. Uh, uh, children know this. It's quite tempting in a, a school situation to to program uh, a choir or a band uh, band repertoire that entirely consists of medleys from the latest hit movie and of um, of popular tunes uh, and songs, both contemporary and and of a previous generation. I'm not saying that one should never program those things of course not they're, they're, they're fantastic we learn so much and there's a tremendous amount of fun but we need to be moving uh, children children's musical experience as performers as well as listeners beyond that into new uh, realms to them so that they, they, their ears and their minds expand in a school situation of course <clears throat> excuse me there's um there's a temptation to program a very great deal or indeed all of Movie, movie, movie scores and pop tunes because it's popular with the parents and it's popular with the principal and with the P and C and there is inherently a tension there between the performance outcome and how well received that's going to be and the best pedagogical outcomes for the children who are actually doing the performing and so one needs to, to, to consider these things in a balanced way when choosing repertoire and also, there's a lot to think about there if you are a composer writing for musically untrained children. So today there is sometimes in people's minds a false distinction between composers who write for children and composers. Uh, and I say false distinction because, of course, some of the greatest composers in history have deliberately set about writing music for children, for amateurs, sometimes writing music in which there are parts for children, for amateur musicians, and for professional musicians at the same time. And this idea of having more than one level of technical skill required in the same composition is an idea called polytechnicality and that is at the heart of my own musical thought as as a composer and a music educator if you consider some of the works as far back as Vivaldi who had a job uh, in a school for a while and would write works for for himself to play as a professional and much easier parts for his students uh, Haydn when he was in the employ of the Esterhazy family, wrote a, a great deal of music for members of the family to join in with. Their parts were technically easier than those for the professional uh, musicians uh, who, who were his, his staff there in that particular uh, aristocratic home. In terms of the contemporary scene, um, polytechnicality as it is now, I think the seeds were sown uh, and the first harvest reaped by Benjamin Britten, whom I mentioned earlier, the English composer from 1913 to 1976. And when I talk about Britten's music for children, I'm not really including uh, a piece like The Young Person's Guide 
to the orchestra, which is a great, great masterwork, but was composed for professional musicians to play and children to listen to. I'm talking about the works in which children take an important part in the performance. And the very first of these that Britain wrote uh, that, that, that remains in the repertoire was uh, St. Nicholas, uh, a cantata for uh, a couple of choirs and soloists, uh, including a children's choir and, and a high school choir, but a professional tenor uh, taking the part of St. Nicholas himself, which was written in the late 1940s. There are a number of techniques there in writing for choir that are effective but don't make unnecessary technical demands that I would like to explore in depth uh, a little bit later in this video. There are also a number of things in St. Nicholas that don't quite come off in terms of polytechnical writing. And it was in the following decade that, um, th that Britain really laid the foundation and wrote the, 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 the absolute foundational work, in my view, of polytechnical music, which was Noah's Flood. Later in life, Britain wrote a number of other works that could be regarded to be polytechnical. They have parts for, for, for children, for amateurs, for, for um, the audience. Uh, the Little Sweep, Let's Make an Opera is, is a really good example of that. His very last piece that he composed uh, in his old age in 1976 was written for children and is polytechnical. But it was Noah's Flood, based on the, on the biblical story, um, that really, it's a work that sh shines as, as, a, as a luminous example of what can be done with great music performed at several different levels uh, of, of, of technical capacity. So Noah and his wife require quite good singers, typically, uh, you know, a, 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 an older teenager, a senior student at school would be able to take on these roles. There's a piano duet, which is demanding four hands at one piano. You've got to have a couple of really very good pianists there. The orchestra consists of uh, a string quintet who have to play at a near professional level. And then multiple levels of easier string parts. So the violins um, go right down to fourth violin, which is almost entirely open strings. A kid who's just picked up the violin a month or two before can just about get through the fourth violin part in Noah's Flood. Similarly, there is a part for a highly competent percussionist and then another six percussion parts for a more elementary level players playing instruments such as um, teacups slung up on strings and all sorts of things like that as well. Um, and there is a capacity as well for a very, very large chorus of small children playing the animals who go onto the ark two by two, who only really have to learn two or three short ostinato phrases and some choreography and of course look cute in the costume. The final element in this musical tapestry is the audience or congregation as Britain describes them because it's a, because it's a religious work and they are called upon uh, at three different occasions during Noah's Flood to actually join in singing hymns which were well known in, in Great Britain in the 1950s. The thing fits together beautifully and is great music and great art despite being made from these, uh, in some cases, rather unlikely ingredients. And in this spirit, composers, uh, particularly in the UK, I have to say, but also around the world and in Australia, have taken on the, the polytechnical large work, the, 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 the opera or the pageant um, involving professional musicians and children and sometimes the audience as well. These, these composers are people like Malcolm Williamson, Peter Maxwell Davis, whose very last work was, was a polytechnical stage work in this spirit, uh, John Barber, again in the UK, and here in Australia, uh, composers like Paul Stanhop James, Humberston and myself. I will be talking about some of my own polytechnical work uh, a little bit later on in this video.
So polytechnicality then is the idea that within one musical composition there are parts which require differing levels of technical capacity. It's an important idea for composers in some parts of the world to embrace. Much of my recent work in polytechnicality has been in concert band music for schools because much of the commercially published concert band music is very clearly and deliberately only written for one level. It therefore assumes that every child in the ensemble has an equal level of technical skill. Now, we all know that, that that's not true. So, in practice, a polytechnical composition uh, for band will also have a number of parts which I sometimes call rookie parts for the less experienced or less capable players, um, particularly on the very popular instruments, flute, clarinet, alto sax, trumpet, trombone, percussion. Uh, that enables participation, doing music with other people is the whole idea, isn't it? Isn't that the aim of the exercise, to get people performing music together and therefore facilitating that by writing easier parts for the less experienced players and in certain cases, which I'll talk about later, writing more challenging parts for those children who are likely to get bored. So th this is responding as well to an extent to local conditions. It's quite true that, that the commercially published uh, concert band music from the big publishing houses in the United States meets the demands of that country quite well because in the big cities and the suburbs, <coughs> schools have a, 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 a large, large student body and perhaps eight, nine or ten graded bands. <coughs> Sorry, I seem to have swallowed a frog. And if... Um, a student is making very rapid progress and getting bored in a band, they can, by audition, move up to the next band, which plays more challenging repertoire. So therefore, having a repertoire that, that, that is uh, of a consistent technical level for everybody in one particular chart makes perfect sense. In Australia, it does not. There are very few schools who have more than two concert bands, many only one, and we all know the experience, I'm sure as music educators, of having a band with one or two kids who are getting bored, frankly, because it's too easy for them, and then the kids who are playing at a, an appropriate level, and then the, the, the strugglers or the newbies or the, uh, the rookies who are really finding it very difficult indeed. Polytechnicality is a solution to that. Uh, I've had conversations with various people, uh, composers and publishers in the United States who view the idea with horror, the idea that you can have different levels of difficulty in the, in the, same, in the same piece. They, they seem to think it's a manifestation of incompetence rather than uh, an essential part of providing an, a meaningful musical experience to every child in our ensembles. So there is an extent to which polytechnicality is designed for local conditions, but reflect on the fact that the local conditions that prevail in Australia are typical of most of the world, with the exception of the United States of America, possibly Japan and Korea as well. But most of Europe, um, New Zealand, uh, that have programs that are much smaller and therefore have different abilities in the same ensemble. So having then dealt with why I compose music for children, um, I'd like to talk a little about what music I write for children. And I'll start with the, with the opera. Yes, I wrote an opera for a primary school. Uh, it's called The Selfish Giant. Uh, and it's been it's been performed a number of times in in New South Wales. It's based on the short story by Oscar Wilde in the uh, in the uh, the Little Prince collection, I think it is. And it is designed so that every child in a primary school from year three to year six can have a meaningful performance part 
in an opera. There are professional or at least uh, highly qualified amateur musicians required as well. The part of the giant um, needs to be played by an, an adult with a, a bass baritone voice, <laughs> preferably a very tall adult as well. So I, I, I conducted the premiere performance of this and we used a, a very brilliant young opera singer, uh, Separate induced to perform that. But I've been to subsequent performances in a K-12 school where the primary school have performed The Selfish Giant, but the giant himself was a year 11 boy who took on the part uh, in a very capable way as well. Then there is the, um, then there's the adult instrumental ensemble, which originally was for seven uh, various instruments. I've subsequently rewritten that so that it, it may be played by piano duet, that is two, uh, two pianists, four hands on one piano, and a percussionist. Um, either way will do, or indeed a combination of them, because flexibility in orchestration in situations like this is important because it enables more people to take play uh, to take part it increases the 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 performability of the work and the accessibility of the work the children then the vast bulk of the children there are one or two soloists from from the children but the vast bulk of children have tasks assigned uh, by year group so that for example year four um, who were doing a band program have elementary concert band parts and uh, also an off percussion ensemble as well. So they form the rest of the orchestra. Um, year six, for example, uh, have parts as birds and have parts as uh, the bricks in the wall that the giant builds around his garden. What that means is that each each of the year group having specific things to do means that their bit can be rehearsed in their music lesson so that you're not constantly asking for uh, all of the children to be taken out of class for a rehearsal. Principals really don't like it when you take children out of class for rehearsals. They don't seem to mind it with sports people, but, you know, we're not as important as that, evidently. The only time in The Selfish Giant where... All of the children come together is is for the finale, so you do need some time to do that. But it's design like that, the practicalities of it, that that a composer needs to think about. It's an advantage having um, you know taught in schools for many many years of how do we facilitate this? How do we make this as accessible as we possibly can? I've also written uh, polytechnical uh, choral pieces. I um, I was commissioned a few years ago to compose the finale for the High Seas Festival. Uh, um, this is one of those combined school camp things. This was a, a year five to eight event. And uh, the finale where all, all the children are singing, this was performed in, in Sydney Town Hall. Um, the professional parts here are the accompaniment, a piano duet, I've mentioned piano duets three times uh, in this talk, much to my surprise, but it's a very versatile and inclusive sort of um, uh, accompaniment technique that, that, that I know that um, com composers of opera, of chamber opera, uh, in the contemporary scene increasingly are turning to it. The, 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 every, you know, you can reasonably assume that there's a piano available. If you sit two pianists on it side by side, you do more than just double the instrumental capacity of having one pianist, in my opinion. And the, the, and the, the, the variety in texture, for example, that becomes available to you is so much greater. So Ring Out Wild, Be Wild Bells involves a piano duet. And because it was in Sydney Town Hall, I couldn't resist Using the uh, using the great organ there as well, the music itself, the the singing parts are are, are in three parts S A B with uh, occasional divisions, and the um, the techniques that I use to make this 
technically quite easy are the same techniques that Britain uses in St. Nicholas, which I mentioned earlier, and other works. When people are writing choral works, they sometimes get this idea that everything has to be in full harmony all the time. Number one, that's difficult to perform. And number two, texturally, that's rather dull and wears on the ear after a while. So ring out wild bells, and um, I hope you'll be able to hear a little example of that in a moment, contains choral techniques such as unison singing. Start with that. Canon. Canon is a really good way to get harmony and textural variety in things that is quite easy. Think about singing row, row, row your boat when you're, when you're very, very young. Child, children can achieve that. Then uh, harmony techniques such as using parallel thirds. Alto singers become so accustomed to that very early in their careers that it comes extremely naturally to them. And it's a useful skill later on when, when you know, in, in, in a pop music situation, for example, or musical theatre, it all, it all helps. The other thing with um, choral uh, uh, harmony, choral harmony singing, is the technique that I call the opening flower. And Britain uses this quite a lot as well. To, to have full harmony is quite difficult. So you make that easier. And it goes like this. You don't simply start by expecting four different notes at the same time because that's hard and a lot of kids can't do that. But if you have everybody singing in unison and then the melody moves up by step but the harmony moves down by step so you've got two sets of parallel thirds going and then open that still further the opening flower, so you get the full harmony texture, but it, you've facilitated that for the singers. And in a situation like that, I find children are, and, and teenagers are quite often very surprised at how amazing it sounds, and in fact, how difficult it wasn't to achieve that. Not my invention, you can see this in St. Nicholas and in other of, of, of Britain's choral works and, and other composers as well. But those kind of techniques will, for a composer, help to maximise the choral effects that you can get without needlessly overtaxing your, um, your singers. Yeah. 
move then to my uh, my music for percussion instruments and string instruments, which is a good deal of it published by Australian Autumn Music, who have asked me to make this video today. They do some wonderful work by their stuff. Was that that was an advert? How about that? Um, so. We turn to um, a, a percussion piece I wrote called "Nothing Stops Music." I wrote this during the um, during the lockdown times, or when we were just coming out of lockdown times. I don't know if you recall in in many jurisdictions in Australia, playing of wind instruments was not allowed, singing was not allowed. Some we have to do something in those uh, in those in those rehearsal situations. So 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 nothing stops music is written for body percussion. So that you know, and it's fully notated, and there are, there are claps and pats and clicks and stamps and the things that you would expect for body uh, for body percussion. There is some polytechnicality in there as well. There are four parts. They're called, I think, northeast, south, and west, and one of them is easier than the others. Only the conductor knows that because we don't really, if we can possibly avoid it give a child the idea that he's got the easy part because uh, you know you're not you're not real bright um so so one of those parts is easier uh and it all fits together it's polytechnical it's there's also a second part of it which which is a a canonic passage which is harder than the first part and the second part of it is optional and as far as I can tell, it's very rarely performed. Most most ensembles just just perform the first bit because they are um, looking for uh, something that can be ready very very quickly because that's very gratifying for the students and and, and quite understandable. Um, then we have um, then we have the string music, things like um, stamp your feet, do a little jig. And things like uh, an arrangement of an English folk song, Old Towler, which have got polytechnical string parts. So first violins, quite difficult, maybe up to third position. Some solo passages in there as well, something to stretch the good players. Uh, right down the second, there's third violin, which only stays in first position. There's fourth violin, which is almost entirely, or I think in some cases, entirely, entirely open strings. Flexibility is part of this polytechnical writing as well, so there is an optional keyboard part to cover anything that might be missing in your string ensemble, like violas, double basses, who typically uh, are, are, are quite hard to find. And there's also a flute and a clarinet part in there optionally, in case you've got kids floating around who play those instruments, you might as well give them something useful to do. My band music for elementary uh, level uh, bands is uh, was previously published under the Our Band uh, label, but is now independent, uh, published as independent charts, uh, currently available on my own website, jimcoilmusic.com. Um, these are pieces that typically are about grade one and a half or grade two, for the majority of the instruments, but they also have the the rookie parts for the popular instruments that I, I mentioned before: flute, clarinet, alto saxophone, trumpet, trombone, percussion, which in some cases I describe as level one quarter. I don't even know if that's a thing, but there are are some things. For example, the most popular of these is is a piece I composed called "Disco Isn't Dead; It Just Smells Funny." Um, and I quite often will go to a, a primary school and the band 
are, are, are playing that as part of their repertoire. The rookie flute part for that has got exactly one note in it. Um, and, you know, it's an easy note. It's A. Most children can make that speak on the flute at least 70% of the time. Um, so there's some very, very easy stuff in there. Everybody gets involved, though. Those parts are integral. They're part of the musical fabric. They're not mere afterthoughts into these misshapen bottles and so on and so on and so on. Um, the, 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 the last uh, body of polytechnical work that I want, of my own that I want to discuss, and, and I'm really very pleased with these, are my, um, are my spotlight miniature concertos. These are published by Matt Close, that's K-L-O-H-S, Matt Close uh, Music, and um, he's, he's done a beautiful job with the editions and everything as well. So the idea is this, this not only caters to the, the mainstream and the rookies, those who, uh, who whose playing isn't, isn't yet up to a very high standard, this also caters for that kid who is so much better than everybody else. They are concertos. They're short concertos, six or seven minutes long. Typically, they are in the classical fast, slow, fast model, because we might as well take this opportunity to teach young people what a concerto actually is and how it works. And this, there are six of them, and the solo instruments are flute, clarinet, trumpet, trombone, alto saxophone, and piano, because We've got the piano kid. This kid is astonishingly good at the piano, but it's kind of hard to make it an ensemble instrument or to find an ensemble situation to allow that young person to really shine and show their, their very, very best. So, so, so these spotlight concertos will do that. Uh, there are rookie parts as well for the less experienced players. The um, the other thing about them, again, built-in flexibility, there is a keyboard part which is a sort of condensed version of everything else, just in case you've got gaps in the orchestration. Obviously, there are cross-cued, you know, horn parts cued in the saxophones and the normal kind of stuff, but the keyboard is there to cover everything. There's also a generic bass part for the time when and this is a nightmare situation, but it does happen. You haven't got a tuba or a bassoon or a bass clarinet or a baritone sax, and, and you've got no genuine bass part. So there's this generic bass part. If you can find a kid who plays bass guitar or can play it on the keyboard, or if you've got a, a spare cellist floating around or something of that order. Flexibility means inclusion. Inclusion means that young people are having a meaningful musical experience, and that ultimately is the most important thing of all. So I've got um, a, a, a bit of an audio recording now of uh, of one of these uh, one of these spotlight concertos. This is the the clarinet one, which is called "A Tale of Three Cities." <laughs>
So the third and final part of my talk is uh, having dealt with why write for children and what I write for children, how to write for children. And in my mind, it's very important to have an idea of the first six notes and the first six months. Um, it's one of it's an understanding that a composer needs to have of the capacity of the popular instruments, what they can do from the very get go, and what they can do six months or so later, depending on the uh, the progress of the individual musician. The capacity of instrumentalists in the very early stages varies from instrument to instrument more than people sometimes think and certainly more than for example elementary band methods seem to suppose but there are some things that elementary beginner musicians can do better than most people think uh, and some things they can do worse. One of the notable things that they can do better than most people think is to play quite complex syncopated rhythms. I, I find that, that, that children and young people can play syncopated rhythms very, very easily if you show them, clap them, sing them, play them, the rhythm. The complication comes when you rely solely on notation because in syncopated rhythms very often there is a tie so that's counterintuitive because you've got two note heads producing only one sound and that's that's counterintuitive and confusing but if you say okay that goes da 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 kids will pick it up no trouble at all the thing that some composers assume can be done and in fact is quite a lot harder is dynamics uh, depending on the instrument. But I find, for example, in very early stages, saxophonists have to make a choice between playing in tune and playing, you know, anything less than fortissimo. Uh, it's just one of those technical things that they haven't got their heads on yet. So when writing for absolute elementary level band, it is reasonable to assume that the loudest thing in the room is going to be the, uh, the, the alto saxes of whom there are often very, very many. So I just uh, just cite those as an example. I just want to go through uh, the most elementary of the instruments and talk about uh, their capacities at the very, very beginning level and what the first six notes are. I hope with some um, notated illustrations of that. So going in score order, we turn first, of course, to the flute. The first five or six notes available on the flute, the important thing here is that they don't go across a break in register. They're not the same notes as flute players who are learning through one of the mainstream band programs will play uh, at first. And that's a major problem with those programs, actually. Um, the hardest thing for a beginner on the flute is to make the thing speak in the first place. It's very difficult to get any kind of sound out of it, and, and that takes a bit of getting used to. The other thing as well about these notes is that the octave is more or less interchangeable depending on how the student is blowing. It, it, it's quite possible that the, the, the note will shift octave, sometimes without the student even noticing, and I don't think that's a significant problem in the early stages. Um, Give your flutes something interesting to do uh, and don't cover them up with a whole bunch of other stuff because it's very easy when composing for, for band particularly to cover the flute sound with saxophones and brass instruments. Turning to the clarinet, the clarinet's first, first notes are pretty much the same ones as one finds in the band method books. They are reasonably straightforward to make them speak. Uh, and the clarinet actually at the very early stages 
does have the capacity to to have quite a ri- range of dynamics, which is something for composers to bear in mind. You don't have to have all the instruments going all the time, by the way. If you want to feature a clarinet section or a flute section, it's perfectly all right to give everybody else rests, although I wouldn't give beginners rests any longer than, than eight bars, because counting is hard. Clarinets, though... Um, the, the the two difficult things again are getting the reed right so that the instrument will speak, and with small hands, the fingers covering the holes entirely. If you find your clarinets making a strange sound, it's often because there the, 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 there are bits of air escaping through the the finger holes when they shouldn't be. Can I say a word as well in favour of the bass clarinet as as a really really useful bass instrument in in a in a young ensemble? The fingering is identical to that of the clarinet, and the way the students read it in treble clef, transposing down a ninth, is exactly the same as the B flat clarinet. They make a beautiful rich bass sound to your ensemble, and are comparatively inexpensive compared that is to bassoons baritone saxes tubers instruments of that sort if your school uh, band has a budget for purchasing instruments seriously consider investing in bass clarinets we move now to the saxophone family and far and away the most popular saxophone at the early stages is the alto Uh, it's comparatively uh, small and manageable although primary school children find the physical weight of it difficult to manage. Those harnesses that help to support the weight are really, really useful. Um, and it's a, it's a relatively cheap and popular instrument. As I mentioned before, the main difficulty in the early stages with the alto saxophone is controlling the dynamic. E- even with Players with very sensitive ears who can hear that they're playing too loud, they back off a little bit and the sound will sag in pitch considerably. And it takes a deal of practice for players to actually be able to manage an in-tune sound as something less than a than a, a fortissimo. So this is something important for composers to bear in mind, is that, you know, if you're writing for very elementary saxophones, they are going to be loud and so you need it's almost like going back to the to the medieval and renaissance times when there were loud instruments and quiet instruments and composers wrote for them in in that way um tenor saxophones have the same problem as a flute in that in the elementary band methods by and large their first few notes are notes that go over a break of register and therefore that makes that really quite difficult so you need the, so so the written uh, the written notes for all saxophones um in terms of the first notes that's best to learn are the same but of course the transpositions mean that the the sounding pitches are different when you come to consider that with the tenor sax it means that writing for very very ele- elementary band requires tenor sax parts that have been constructed quite thoughtfully uh to accommodate the optimal register for the instruments and to avoid the whole uh, C, C sharp, D and going across the break of register thing uh, which which happens too early in too many scores in my opinion. Um, moving, to, moving to brass instruments, the, the most popular ones are the trumpet and the trombone. Uh, the trumpet again is buzzing the, mic, uh, bu- buzzing the mouthpiece, getting the thing to speak getting the, 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 the muscles right on on open notes, that is notes without any vowels, to produce either C or G. Most students will produce C more easily than G. And then as they uh, move up the scale, anything higher than G in the early stages is going to be very, very difficult. Getting, getting it to the instrument to speak above that sec- second line G is quite hard in the early stages. The trombone has almost the opposite problem in that in first position when the instrument is, uh, the slide is right up as close to the, the face as possible, it's more likely that the F, that is the fourth line on the bass clef F, will speak rather than the B flat below it. Uh, and a lot of very elementary scores require the B flat B 
before the F. And I think that's the wrong way around. I think um, if you think of and, and a trombone is exactly an octave lower than, than a trumpet, right? It's double the size. But, but, but that doesn't mean that the very first notes are the same. So the very first notes, I would say, for the, for the trumpet are C, D, E. But for the, uh, for the trombone, F, E flat, D are more likely to come before B flat, C, D. The other thing about C on the, on the trombone is that it is in sixth position, which... Most kids can't reach their arms, simply aren't long enough to reach sixth position. And so therefore that note C, which is on the second uh, the second uh, space of the bass clef, is almost always going to be significantly sharp just because they can't reach that. There's something for composers to bear in mind. Turning to string instruments, the... <sighs> considerations here are on the face of it more easy and obvious than they are with woodwind and brass instruments. String instruments have a, a, a greater dynamic range built in from the very beginning because that's just part of how the bow works. Uh, obviously the first things are the open strings followed by notes in first position. Um, and you can, if, you, if you're not a string player and you don't know what the notes in first position are, it's very easy to, to, to find a, a fingering chart which will show you what those things are. They're pretty much exactly what you would expect them to be, actually. One thing that I advocate for quite strongly with elementary string playing is double stops, that is two strings at the same time, at least one of which is an open string. So on the violin, for example, you could write a chord, a double stop with the open A and then F sharp on the E string at the same time. If, for example, you've got a loud D major chord, having that in there is, is a really good idea because number one, it increases the tone weight of the instrument and players at the early stages do tend to squeak rather quietly like little mice rather than actually playing uh, properly. And secondly, you get those double stops sometimes, in fact, many times, accidentally. That the, the, the angle of the bow is difficult to control, and so students will engage two strings when they really only intended to gauge one. So you might as well make a virtue of a necessity and write that in, especially, as I say, in loud passages as well. Um... Moving on to piano and keyboard instruments, at the very early stages, uh, composers need to consider a single hand position. That is, do, 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 one, two, three, four, five, and those are your notes, and the, 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 the hand won't move at all, and you've got another five notes there in your, at the very elementary level. That's what you need to do. Actually moving the thumb, thumb under and, and shifting the hand happens a little bit later. Can you write interesting, imaginative, engaging music that doesn't involve a pianist moving hand position? Yes, you can, because you are an imaginative composer. You're a composer who finds technical restrictions an interesting challenge rather than a frustration. So with instruments like flute, oboe, tenor sax, French horn, some tubers, why is it that the band methods make it so difficult for those players to start by giving them suboptimal notes to start on. It's this, is that, that there is this idea that children in ensembles learn music better when everybody is in unison playing the tune. And I reject that as a premise. I think, I think children understand that everybody has a different part to play. Some have bass lines, some have harmony, some have rhythmic parts, some have the melody, some have counter melody, some have a rest. Uh, and, and I really think that, that it is uh, underestimating their level of, of capacity to understand how a complex uh, thing like a score for a large ensemble fits together and where their role is in it. So th th that leads us to, to, to practical polytechnicality, making musically rewarding experiences for players of all levels on all 
instruments. Composers have a lot to think about here. Um, in many respects, writing for musicians with these technical limitations is more challenging than writing for great virtuosos or, or professional musicians. It certainly brings its own set of problems which require solution. But in solving those problems, composers are making a really valuable contribution to repertoire uh, and are actually thoughtfully, meaningfully providing music, good music, even great music for our children and our young people to perform. And that, I believe, is extremely important. Thank you very much for listening to this uh, video. Jim Coyle here from Sydney Conservatorium of Music speaking to you on behalf of Australian Autumn Music.